Hello, everyone. This is Yasmina Sisarak. I am your host for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for our COVID-19 webinar series presented by the Health Matters Program in the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago through continued partnership with Project Search and their funding from the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council in collaboration with Aspire Community Services in Illinois. These, um, the summer webinar series um, are really meant to provide a space for community providers to share their experiences in maintaining services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. These webinars will be recorded and archived, and you will be emailed once the webinar has been archived. During the webinar, please note your questions in the chat box, and we will ask these questions during the last 15 minutes of the webinars. So for today's presentation, our ninth in the webinar series, even during a crisis, people with disabilities have rights. We are delighted to have Robin Jones, the director of the Great Lakes ADA Center, and Barry Taylor, vice president for civil rights and systemic litigation at the Equipped for Equality. Uh, this pr presentation will provide updates on issues related to COVID-19 and Americans with Disabilities Act. In addition, this session will address the rights that people with IDD have as their employment options reopen and as agencies begin to bring people back into the workplace. I'm going to have um, the presenters introduce themselves and uh, take over the presentation. Welcome, Ro Robin and Barry. Great, thank you very much, Yasmina, and welcome everyone um, to today's session as we are on the cusp of the uh, 30th anniversary of the ADA, which will occur this weekend. So the timing for this is also perfect. As introduced, I'm the director of the Great Lakes ADA Center, and we have been uh, operating since 1991, um, and we cover the states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin, providing technical assistance training and consultation on the ADA. We are part of the ADA National Network. So those of you who have joined us outside of my region, um, you would also be able to find out about the center that may serve your geographic area um, at www.adata.org. That's the ADA National Network. And I'll let Barry go ahead and introduce himself. Thanks, Robin, and hi, everybody. My name is Barry Taylor, and as I, uh, as Amina said, I'm the uh, Vice President for Civil Rights at Equip for Equality. For those of you who aren't familiar with Equip for Equality, we are the protection and advocacy agency for the state of Illinois. Uh, basically, every state has an agency like ours, and we're the one for the state of Illinois providing free legal advocacy services for people with disabilities in Illinois. Uh, it, like Robin said, if you are calling or participating outside of Illinois and you'd like to learn about the Protection Advocacy Agency in your state, you can go to our National Association's website, National Disability Rights Network, which is ndrn.org, and find the Protection Advocacy Agency in your state. I'm here today uh, wearing my Illinois ADA Project hat, which is a program that the Great Lakes ADA Center funds to provide training and technical assistance on, to all ADA stakeholders. And so we're delighted to be here and look forward to um, sharing you with you some hopefully some very useful information. Great, thank you, Barry. So Barry, you wanna go ahead, next slide. So we're gonna um, split this uh, presentation up a little bit here, just to talk about the beginning part, some of the issues, um, gonna talk about the ADA and the COVID-19 pandemic, non-discrimination requirements. We're gonna discuss specifically things like public spaces and social distancing, access to, to PPE, um, which I'll talk more about, face coverings requirements, transportation issues, closure of services and programs, education, and then just briefly about what the future holds before I turn it over to Barry to talk specifically about employment. So, next slide. So just to keep in context, and this is something that we found is problematic and has been an issue um, as we've been going through this since March, is that many people have kind of forgotten um, and trying to look at how we put in the context and our analysis of issues that we may face um, both in our organizations and as well as those individuals that we serve as it relates to the ADA. The ADA is a civil right. It's still in effect, um, even though there is a pandemic. However, there may be modifications necessary to address the potential threat that is posed by the pandemic. Um, it should be understood by everyone that things like this pandemic were totally unforeseen um, in, the, um, uh, in, this, 
a process uh, in the writing of the ADA, just as we can look at um, when the ADA was passed in 1990 and shortly thereafter where we had the AIDS um, crisis uh, or the increase in uptick in AIDS and such. That was never um, anticipated in the uh, drafting of the ADA. And so there was a great deal of discussion and debate at that time as to whether or not it was um, uh, HIV and AIDS a disability. In fact, we ended up with a Supreme Court decision um, that had to make that particular decision. There has not been a um, legal determination at this point that COVID-19 is it, itself a disability. We do know that there are individuals who because of COVID-19 and the residual result of COVID-19 have long-term and potentially chronic um, health conditions. You hear about them in the news, you hear about them discussed as far as respiratory, heart disease, things of that nature that are exacerbated um, because of this. And we also know that there are people with disabilities, certain conditions more so than others, um, that are more susceptible to this particular disease. So it just needs to be kept in mind that the ADA still is in effect. The ADA is a civil right. It does not specifically provide a benefit of any type. Um, it is a civil right and is applied as such. Our state and local government officials continue to have obligations for compliance during the ADA pandemic, but they may need to make adjustments to their policies, practices, and procedures in order to address health and safety issues and risks for the public. There's been quite a bit, and it's changing science on a daily basis. When you look at what's being put out by the CDC and the WHO, um, World Health Organization, and the Centers for Disease Control, and, and various different medical professionals, um, it seems to be somewhat of a revolving door, but we're, we have to pay attention to that um, because it is an issue of putting ourselves at risk and putting others at risk. Situations such as COVID-19 are not really addre directly addressed, as I said, in the ADA, but we still use that framework under Title II and Title III, and Barry will talk about Title I, of non-discrimination, modification of policy, practice, and procedure unless it poses a fundamental alteration in the program services or activities making reasonable accommodations when necessary, ensuring we have effective communication or the provision of auxiliary aids and services when needed, and then ensuring we have program access when we're talking about state and local government programs. So let's start by talking about some of the spaces and some of the issues. So public spaces and social distancing. Obviously, there's been a lot of reduction in space access due to the um, uh, pandemic, mostly because of the inability to maintain social distancing and the risk associated with the congregate groups, et cetera. So this has had a lot of impact on people who might participate in um, group related um, activities, um, maybe participating in park district activities or other kinds of things, um, uh, day camps and, and things of that nature. Um, all of those have had to be discontinued because of the potential spread um, of the COVID-19. And while that has a um, impact on people with disabilities who rely on those things, uh, oftentimes for their socialization um, and, and uh, other things, um, that it's just a, it's a necessity that's had to happen from a health perspective. A lot of discussion and there's mimes all over the place in the concept of social distancing, which also means that's the elimination of any hugging, handshaking, touching, or close contact. Um, this greatly impacts the ability to give any direct assistance to someone who may need it in a store or in the workplace or in the restaurant. Um, and so we've seen this as an issue where somebody may have been used to going into their grocery store or going in to some type of other establishment and receiving one-on-one -on -one assistance from a clerk or something of that nature to assist them. Um, those services are no longer going to be available. Personal services are no longer available because of those one-on-one -on -one, um, close contact types of interaction. Um, this obviously has a, a negative impact on people with disabilities, but again, um, you know, we're talking about something here that has got a direct threat uh, potential here to uh, impact the, the health and safety of um, individuals and a lot of unknown. So um, while it, it may um, and does, I mean, we can definitely talk about, does it have a disparate impact on people with disabilities? It does on anybody who needs this kind of one-on-one um, -on -one personalized uh, assistance. So we're seeing limiting in the numbers, uh, you know, in things like gyms, workspaces, restaurants, stores, all of those kinds of things. Individuals who do require assistance to complete a task may request that they be allowed to bring an individual with them to assist them. Um, and that's something that the entity or the establishment would need to consider um, that you would be able to bring somebody in to assist you one-on-one -on -one, where they may not, no longer be able to provide you that one-on-one -on -one assistance due to um, the potential uh, safety risk related issues. 
one of the things that rises in this particular pandemic is this you know issue of um, uh, normal or regular um, legitimate safety uh, guidelines, safety regulations. And you know again, this is a moving science, and there's definitely been the argument in Department of Justice, Health and Human Services, um, uh, Centers for Disease Control have all made the argument of the fact that what we're talking about here is legitimate safety requirements um, that are uh, a problematic, uh, we know, for people with disabilities. Um, access to personal protective equipment, or PPE, has been a huge problem in the disability community. There's a shortage overall of um, uh, PPE available to the medical community, to those that are in need, but particularly it's been problematic for people um, with disabilities in the community who rely on um, service providers, uh, personal care assistance, things of that nature, high costs associated with this due to the shortages and price gouging, price gouging by sellers and such. Um, and much of the equipment has been directed to healthcare providers versus providing support um, for individuals living in the community. There's been some efforts more recently to try to um, get that um, greater um, access. I was just recently on a conference call with HHS, Health and Human Services, which has been trying to work through some policy related issues to try to get more PPE directed community-based organizations and individuals in the community. But again, this is just an ongoing struggle and an issue. People with disabilities and their caregivers need access to PPP as, as well. Um, and there are some organizations that have been created. Um, the Chicago area has some organizations. I know that there's organizations across the country um, that have been created to assist people specifically with obtaining PPE, such as helping to make face masks or um, using their um, uh, 3D printers to, to uh, print face shields and things of that nature to try to get that um, out to uh, more people um, in a low cost or free uh, manner. So it's something that, you know, um, definitely networking in your own communities to find out who these or groups and organizations might be um, that can help you and get this commitment to individuals on a one-on-one. -on -one. And then of course, there's the issue of proper use of the PPE by caregivers and individuals. Um, this continues to be an issue of discussion and education need. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, ongoing um, issue within organizations and such and how to teach um, people on how to use that, using pictures, using video and things of that nature. Um, and we know that there's a high percentage of people within the IDD community who may not be able to use masks because of health-related issues, disability-related issues, maybe um, sensitivity of their skin, um, might be um, issues related to sensory, um, issues they have uh, just general understanding and compliance to maintain or keep um, it on uh, as other kinds of precautions and things such as hand washing and such of that nature um, has been heightened in awareness of these needs and uh, issues and making sure that people um, are trained in how to do that and how to follow uh, those particular uh, requirements. Go ahead. Face covering has been a huge um, issue. We could talk hours and hours on the issue of face covering requirements, as I've already mentioned. Um, again, the idea behind face covering is you're not only protecting um, yourself, but you're also protecting others um, from the spread of the disease. But again, many people unable to use them. Lack of education also, um, however, exists within public um, and businesses. We do have mandates across many of our states now for mandatory use of masks, both indoors and outdoors, which is creating problems. Majority of those mandates that are coming from governors and mayors and such do have exceptions written within them, but it really doesn't address what those exceptions should be. So while there might be language for the exceptions, we're seeing states where um, there's individuals who may be fined if they're not wearing a face mask, or they're basically saying to businesses, you're not, you're, you're not required at all to allow somebody into your business um, who uses a face mask, which then creates a lot of confusion around what do they do, what, what are the issues. Some of you may be aware of the fact that um, there have been people who have tried to abuse the um, exceptions by saying they have a disability um, when they don't just because they don't want to wear one, and so they use that as an excuse. There was a rash of fake cards going around um, uh, that people were uh, manufacturing and laminating and such saying that the U.S. Department of Justice um, was issuing these cards to people with disabilities and they could carry those with those and a business had to uh, adhere to that under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Totally false. No one is issuing anything. In fact, unfortunately, our federal agencies have not come forward with any guidance or any specific information on this. Many of our state um, civil rights organizations, like the Illinois Human Rights Commission and such, 
um, and similar in other states, have put out fact sheets to businesses and such around the issue of face masks or, or face coverings and what their obligations are um, for people with disabilities or people with medical conditions that cannot use the face covering. But again, it's an issue of education um, and such. I cannot be asked for documentation. I cannot require um, an FC, uh, individual to have documentation um, that they can't use a face covering or that they have a disability. Um, we know that entities are required to make reasonable modification of policy, practice, and procedure to accommodate persons who are unable to use a face mask. Some of those might be um, alternative delivery options for stores, like a curbside service or a home delivery service um, of some type. The key here is it needs to be equivalent. So we've had a lot of people who have contacted us and complained because they are being offered a home delivery or a curbside service being told it's two or three days before they can get it. When if I was going to the store, I could walk in at that moment and walk back out again 10 minutes later with my goods. That is not equivalent. And so the entities still have the obligation to ensure um, that they're providing equivalent um, uh, options for people, which means they may have to have a separate system in place specifically for persons with disabilities than they might for the general public in regards to the timing of when they would um, provide and meet these particular needs for people. And then, of course, the issue of alternative options for receiving care, um, such as doctor's office and such. HHS will be coming out with some fact sheets um, in the next week or two that I've been told that's going to address more clearly some of these obligations of healthcare providers as it relates to facial coverings, um, looking at different alternative types of things, such as um, obviously telehealth, but also the concern of people waiting in the waiting room without masks on and the risk to others options of having people wait in their car or wait somewhere alternatively um, until their time of their appointment, then being escorted um, by a security guard or someone who's appropriately got PPE on, um, who would then navigate that person through the area to minimize their contact with others till they got into the exam room um, uh, or the area of treatment and such of that nature. So really having to look at some of those more creative or other kinds of outside of the box maybe um, answers and solutions to ensuring that people um, have access to the care and such um, that they still need. Transportation has been a big issue, um, access to transportation. Many of the public transportation entities, especially in phase one and phase two, and now I recognize that for many states, their phases are different and how they've characterized their phases and such of that nature than maybe Illinois. But the key is at what point did transportation become available or unavailable? And at what point were different types of modifications made for transportation? So, for example, um, we know that all of the buses and trains and things of that nature are using social distancing. So they're marking off seats and saying that you only can sit in some seats. Well, you know, individuals need to be trained what those look like. If there's X's or if there's some kind of marking that tells you you can't sit there, um, they need to be educated about that. You may have to wait longer because the bus may be full and pass you by because they don't have capacity to take any more additional individuals. We've also seen some temporary um, requirements where, let's say, for example, everyone had to load um, from the back of the bus, <coughs> excuse me, um, instead of the front of the bus to minimize the exposure to the driver um, in the bus or the conductor of the train and such of that nature. Well, in many of our transportation vehicles, the lifts, are on the front of the buses. So they had to make modifications to say, okay, that applies to everybody except those who need to use the lift. And that could be somebody who's ambulatory, but somebody who needs the lift to get on and off because the stairs are problematic. They had to make modifications to allow individuals to still use that front entry where those um, uh, lifts and such um, would be available um, for them. On paratransit, this has been a, a, a huge issue for people because many other transportation industries in, entities discontinued their door-to-door um, -door services and the assistance that they were providing one-on-one -on -one to individuals for transportation. So for example, where they may have allowed a driver to assist somebody from getting from their door onto the vehicle, either pushing the chair or um, holding an arm for them you know, while they were ambulating uh, with a cane or uneven uh, unsteady gait and stuff of that nature, they were no longer allowed to do that due to the social distancing obligations and such which means that you have individuals who became difficult for them to use paratransit services um, because they couldn't get from their door to um, the transit without that particular assistance. And that um, created some problems. Now, again, um, individuals could have somebody in their family or a neighbor or a family member assist them to 
um, the vehicle appropriately um, donned with PPE and such of that nature, um, but the driver um, and the transit entities uh, were not required to, again, um, because of the issues associated with uh, um, the transmission of the disease. The only assistance that is being provided um, uh, by transit providers are the assistance with the lockdowns or the securements for wheelchairs onto um, public transportation uh, vehicles because that's a safety issue in most situations. People can't do that independently, um, and that's a, a huge liability issue for safety for both the individual and others on the, um, on the vehicle. We also know that the ride share programs and taxis implemented uh, mandatory face covering requirements, whether it's Uber, Lyft, or your local taxi company, which means individuals who may have relied on some of those kinds of transportation options and unable to wear um, a face covering could find that those transportation options were no longer available to them. Unfortunately, do, those are, are legitimate safety requirements um, and you know that a entity can impose the nature of that close contact in a vehicle um, with um, a driver and the uh, inability to do properly social distance from the front seat to the back seat um, and such, and the length of time that somebody is in um, a, a vehicle makes a big difference. And when you think about, you know, the issue with facial coverings is there are some people who can't wear them at all. There are some people who can't wear them for long periods of time. And these are all the things that have to be looked at because you may, may be able to put a face covering on for the 10 minutes or the five minutes that it takes to walk through someplace but not be able to keep that face covering on for the hour or 40 minutes or 45 minutes that you might be engaged in an activity or something of that nature. So all of these things have to be looked at um, or whether or not would a face shield um, work as, as an alternative. However, we know that a face shield is open at the bottom um, and that is one of the problems is with a face shield as being the only method um, of protection because of the, again, the potential of the spray droplets and things outside the bottom. But looking at some of those different options um, and how those might uh, meet the needs of individuals. Next. Many of our programs and services have had to close, which has had a negative impact, again, as I said earlier, on people with disabilities, reopening occurring on a very limited basis with social distancing. Um, and again, uh, this will um, you know, increase the number of openings as the COVID numbers decrease. Um, but I think you're gonna see for a long period of time um, a lot of closures and a, a likely reduced programming and such available. Does that have a negative impact on people with disabilities? Definitely. Um, is that discriminatory? It's not necessarily discriminatory because it's not available to everybody, um, not just um, you know people with disabilities. One of the things that we've gotten a lot of calls from <coughs> in our office is related to things like parking lots being closed to access to public spaces and such. Well. The ADA doesn't say you have to have parking. The ADA says parking must be available where it's available to the general public. So where they've removed parking for everyone, there's no obligation that they provide parking for people with disabilities under the ADA. Yes, it might be a customer service issue and things of that nature, but you really can't use the ADA in that context because now parking is available, not available for um, anybody. We're also seeing things like libraries and such reopening. Education has been a huge issue. I wish I had answers, and I think we're going to see a lot happening in the very near future, more and more on this particular issue. We're hearing more and more about the uh, remote or hybrid options for the fall. We know um, from the experience that we've had in the spring of 2020 um, that many individuals or most individuals with special education needs um, were not served well, um, uh, if at all. Um, and now the furthering of the um, uh, uh, pandemic and the closures um, into the fall and potentially even into the winter is going to continue to have this negative impact on education. There's a lot um, coming down, uh, some say not enough yet, um, from the federal level and such. Even I just recently read an article that there is um, some rumor of some uh, um, rules coming down that would exempt schools from certain requirements under IDEA um, during the COVID in regards to least restrictive environments and, and types of services and supports that were provided. This is going to be very problematic on an ongoing basis. And so I think the word of some here is that keep um, tuned, stay involved, and engaged um, with the legal entities and stuff around these particular issues because I think we're going to see a lot more happening. This is also true at the post-secondary level, which is likely also to remain remote or hybrid. Um, accommodating students uh, with disabilities is still an obligation, but we are hearing a lot from students that there's just certain types of disabilities that are very difficult to um, accommodate in the remote. And the switchover in spring was so quick 
um, and people had to do it on a dime, that there was little preparation and such, but now they've had more time to prepare, they've had more time to think through these things and have such, and the concern is that they still are not um, peaking and addressing disability as foremost. So, you know, keep in mind that, you know, all of the laws and regulations related to IDEA, to Section 504, and to the ADA all still apply um, in education, and we need to continue to push our schools and such forward on these issues in assuring that the students with disabilities who need accommodations um, receive appropriate accommodations, even in light of the pandemic. It doesn't allow them to throw it out the door, but there are not as many answers as we'd like yet, um, and this is one of those that stay tuned and more definitely to be happening, or definitely going to be happening in the legal space, I think. Um, so what does the future hold before I hold it over to Barry? Again, unknown timeline unpredictability for what we're dealing with um, through the fall and winter of 2020-21 until we see a vaccine and who knows when that's coming. As we see the gradual reopening, we're also seeing that the COVID-19 numbers are rising in some areas and they're retrenching um, and starting to move backwards in some of our states. So they're rolling back um, restrictions and stuff. What is that going to mean? Uh, fear will continue to always be the driving force um, in this particular issue. State by state, there are differences um, that are creating some confusion. There is no universality around this. So what happens in one state is not necessarily what's happening in another, which is going to remain obviously without a federal mandate or federal um, uh, policy on this. And it's really critical that individuals with disabilities and their advocates continue to be at the table for the discussion for plans within their community schools and organizations moving forward and um, raising the questions, raising the issues, um, pushing it and not just taking, we can't do that um, as an answer. There is maybe at some point we can't do that and maybe it's not gonna be the way you want them to do that. But the issue is what options are available. They may not be the best options, but are they workable options? And I think that's where we're at right now is how can we look at um, those variety of things going forward um, and recognize the, the limitations that we're working under, but still what degree and some degree of accessibility that we can make sure uh, uh, for people with disabilities. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Barry. Thanks, Robin. So I'm gonna shift and talk mainly about employment issues, as Robin alluded to, that's Title I of the ADA. And, and we're gonna look at a number of topics. First is COVID-19 and ADA disability, issues regarding returning to work, telework, medical inquiries and tests, mask requirement in the employment context, associations discrimination, and a bunch of resources at the end. And just to reiterate what Robin said, these issues are very new, and so I know people feel very uncertain about what their legal requirements are. I would say that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which has responsibility to interpret and enforce the ADA, has a lot of great information. We have a slide on that at the end. Uh, and if employers follow that, I think that's a, a good rule of thumb. So first of all, is COVID-19 itself a disability under the ADA? And we're still not sure. We, we're waiting for this to work out in the courts. But um, most of you probably know that uh, under the ADA, you can be covered if you have an actual disability, a record, or a history of disability, or regarded as. And so for actual disability, you have to show that it is an impairment and does it cause a substantial limitation to a major life activity. And I think most courts would find that COVID-19 is an impairment. As Robin alluded to before, HIV and AIDS was considered an impairment. But then the question comes, does it uh, substantially limit a major life activity? And in most severe cases, you're gonna have things like the major life activity of breathing and lung functioning would be substantially limited. But even in milder cases, um, major life activities like interacting with others and communicating, those are clearly impacted and limited by COVID-19. So uh, certainly a good argument that they would be covered under the ADA. And of course, the ADA also covers regarded as uh, people who are regarded as having uh, a substantial limitation to major life activity. Again, you go through whether COVID-19 is an impairment, but then under regarded as, you, there is an exception if uh, an impairment is transitory and minor, it wouldn't be covered under this part of the ADA. Uh, for transitory, the rule of thumb is less than six months, uh, which as Robin said, sometimes it's gonna go longer than that. Um, but in many cases will be less than six months, and then you look and see, is it also minor? So you could have it be a short time, but if it's still a major issue, um, then it could still be considered a disability, even though it was a real, relatively short period of time. So when we talk about people returning to work, which is one of the big questions we get, 
there are a few different options. One, the simplest object option is for a lot of people to say they don't need accommodations and they can return to work with no accommodations. But of course, some folks are going to need accommodations. So can they return with accommodations? Well, some people can if they get those. And some common accommodation examples would be the provision of PPE, uh, the creation of barriers between employees and coworkers or clients. You could get an accommodation of modifying job duties, like removing non-essential tasks and only performing tasks that are possible to be performed maybe off-site or that can be performed while uh, engaging in social distancing. And then working from home or telework is a major uh, accommodation that we're seeing uh, folks uh, exploring during this period. So the general rules of reasonable accommodation apply during COVID-19 as well. So the general rule is that the employee is the one who should identify that they need an accommodation and bring it to their employer, and they engage in what's called an interactive process, which is a, basically a discussion back and forth about what the employee needs and what the employer is willing to provide. And that should be an interactive process with both parties engaging. And employers are entitled to reasonable accommodation, or excuse me, reasonable documentation about two things. One, about the person's disability, if it's not something they already know or it's not obvious, and then the need for the accommodation and sort of how those connect together. Employers do have a responsibility to keep disability-related information confidential when they're given that through the reasonable accommodation process. And COVID should be treated like other confidential information medical. You don't have to have a separate COVID file, but you do need to have a separate medical information file from the rest of the uh, employee's uh, personnel file. And again, employers only have to provide an accommodation if there's a link between the disability and the need for an accommodation. So remember, we're talking about accommodations for people with all disabilities, not just COVID related. So a person with a disability can ask for an accommodation without having COVID, uh, but that is related to COVID issues in the workplace that may be of concern. So if option one and option two don't work, the next option is what's called the assignment as a reasonable accommodation. So um, sometimes you just can't accommodate a person in their current job. And if that's the case, the next step is for an employee to see if they can get an accommodation through reassignment to a different and vacant position. And that may be a good option, but you have to show that, first of all, it's a vacant position. There's no requirement of bumping somebody else out of a position. The ADA doesn't um, require people to be bumped out of positions, although certainly employers can work with other employees and work things out, but it's not required. Um, they also have to be qualified. You can't uh, insist on being um, put in a different position where you don't have the underlying qualifications. And it has to obviously be safe for the employee to work in that vacant position after you've found it's maybe not safe for them to work in their current position. And then you also have to look and see if there's a bona fide seniority system on how to fill vacant positions. So even though a position is vacant, if they have a collective bargaining agreement that they enforce consistently, um, you can't um, modify that because of a reasonable accommodation. And remember that reassignment is considered the accommodation of last resort. Uh, employers are entitled to try to accommodate the employee in their current position because moving somebody to a different position can sometimes be very difficult for an employer because it requires additional training and, and changing in the workplace. So you don't go to reassignment until you can accommodate somebody in their current position. So if maybe that doesn't work, then you look at uh, option four, which is, okay, I just need to have a leave. I can't work for a while. Um, and um, that's uh, something that uh, has been recognized as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. What's tricky is, is that there are other laws and policies out there that are going to apply as well. And just up front, I just want to say that I am an ADA uh, lawyer. I understand discrimination. Um, we have a lot of new things that have come up from the Department of Labor because of COVID. We're all sort of figuring them out. Um, and uh, uh, we've got a lot of resources that will help with some of the very fine-tuned specifics because it, it can get kind of complicated. Uh, but we're at least going to give you the basic information today to get you started. So some employers have internal policies that do offer medical or personal leave. So certainly that would be the first thing to check is, does the employer have their own policies, not just those that are required by law? The important thing for employers to remember is to apply those policies consistently. So when you don't, maybe you accommodate one person but not another, and that person happens to have a disability, that can be problematic, and that's where you can get in trouble under the ADA. The next option to look at then is um, the new law that I was referring to, the Family First Coronavirus uh, Response Act, FFCRA. And there are actually two components 
of the FFCRA. One is Expanded Family Medical Leave Act, which is on this slide, and then the next is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave that's also from the FFCRA. So I'll briefly just tell you what both of those are, and then you've got links to get more details. Uh, and these laws went into effect April 1st, and are at least for now, um, will run until the end of this calendar year. Obviously, it's, in, it's Congress is able to expand it beyond this year, but that's what the laws are applying to right now. So um, the Expanded Family Medical Leave Act, which is basically just the Family Medical Leave Act that many of you are aware of, but just provides some extra protections that aren't in the regular Family Medical Leave Act. It applies to employers uh, with 50 to 500 employees and also some public employees, federal employees that are not covered by this law. Uh, under this law, um, employees may be entitled to up to 12 weeks of job protected leave to care for a child or uh, and a child being 18 or under, or also an adult child with a disability who, is, who needs assistance in uh, care. Um, and in the situation for a, a child whose school is closed or child care provider is unable because of reasons related to COVID-19. Now under this, the, the leave is typically, uh, employers are gonna have to pay two thirds of the regular rate of pay um, after the first two weeks. And we'll talk about what happens in the first two weeks on the next page, which is a little bit broader. So the, um, the other part of the FFCRA is called the Emergency Paid Sick Leave um, component. And this also applies to employers, private employers from 50 to 500 employees and some public employee, employers. And here what we're talking about is getting two weeks paid sick leave to employees who are unable to work or telework and who need uh, leave because of they fall into one of the six the following six categories and the way I read this the first three categories you're entitled to full pay for the first for these first two weeks and under four five and six on this slide you're entitled to two-thirds of your regular pay so these six conditions are first you're subject to a, a government uh, quarantine or isolation second advised by a health care provider to self-quarantine Third, you're experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and seeking medical diagnosis. The fourth is you're caring for an individual subject to quarantine isolation. You're caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed. And Department of Labor has made clear that this is not just um, minor children, but also um, for adult children with disabilities. Or you're experiencing any other similarly, um, substantially similar condition that was specified by the Health and Human Services. So this is the, the two weeks of uh, paid sick leave, and then the other 10 weeks would go to the previous uh, slide that we talked about with the Expanded Family Medical Leave Act. But it doesn't mean that the regular Family Medical Leave Act is gone, because if you can't fall within the, the requirements of the other um, provisions, you still have a right to um, exercise your rights under the Family Medical Leave Act, which has been in place since the Clinton era. And you might remember that employees receive up to 12 weeks of job protected leave. Again, this does not have to be paid. Employers can pay, but they're not required under the traditional Family Medical Leave Act. Um, and the Department of Labor is saying that serious health condition, which is the requirement under the FMLA, can include COVID-19. Um, one thing to remember is the Family Medical Leave Act does not require employers to provide FMLA for the purpose of avoiding exposure to COVID-19. Remember that Family Medical Leave is about taking care of your own health condition or that of a family member. So avoiding exposure is not covered by FMLA. And of course, we have a good old ADA that we talked about already um, when we're talking about leave because under the ADA, leave has been recognized as a form of a reasonable accommodation. One thing that sometimes happens is people try to figure out, well, how does the ADA interplay with other laws like the Family Medical Leave Act? Well, in certain circumstances, we've seen people use their 12 weeks of family medical leave, they're not able to come back, and that's when they ask for an accommodation for additional leave in order to ultimately be able to return to work and perform the essential functions of the job. So people should remember that the ADA is a possibility to use either on its own or in conjunction with these other laws that are out there. ADA is a little different in that leave is not job protected. Um, some courts have limited how much uh, leave is available on the ADA. There's not a certain number of weeks like there is under the FMLA. 
And remember that the uh, leave under the ADA is only for employees. You are not entitled to take leave under the ADA for family members because it's for people with disabilities. So that's a big distinction between the FMLA and the ADA. The other thing that's a big difference is that the ADA applies to more employers. It, imply, it applies to employers with 15, one five or more employees. Whereas I said before, the other laws apply if you have 50, five zero or more employees. So for really smaller um, employers, the ADA may be the only option. I would also recommend that people look at their state laws. So for instance, in Illinois, the Illinois Human Rights Act applies to employers who have one or more employees. So sometimes the ADA won't apply, but state law or another local law might. And then the sort of the last option here is uh, consider unemployment insurance. If you can't figure out a way to make things work in your current job, you may be eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, if you can't return due to a medical condition. In Illinois, the agency that administers unemployment insurance is the Illinois Department of Employment Security. You've got a link there for more information. And again, I am not a, an unemployment insurance attorney either, but I would recommend that you seek legal advice about your rights to unemployment uh, before deciding not to return to work. That's a big decision. Um, there is free legal help on this for those who can't afford a private attorney. A group in, at least in Illinois and Chicago is called Legal Aid Chicago, and we've given you the information for their, uh, their helpline, as well as a link for more information. And because it, uh, unemployment insurance is, is federal, um, even if you're not in Illinois, I think some of these resources might be helpful to you online. Sorry, I'm not getting the slide to move here. There it goes. Okay. So one thing that we are often asked is, do employees have a right to continue working from home? And unfortunately, my answer is it depends, which I know is not the answer let people like to, to hear, but it really does depend on the factual situations as Robin mentioned a lot in her presentation as well. So one of the things you have to ask is, when employees work from home during the pandemic, did they perform all of their essential functions of the job? If yes, it may be reasonable for employers to allow employees to continue to do so when other employees come back to work. Um, but if not, if they weren't able to do their essential functions of the job during um, when the office was closed, it's likely not going to be reasonable. Uh, and even if the employer excused employee, employees from certain job tasks while their business was closed, the employer is not required to continue to excuse those essential parts of the job. One thing that's interesting under the, under the pandemic is that generally before the pandemic, many courts viewed telework as disfavored. They thought, you know, physical presence in the office is an essential function. And some courts agreed with that. But what we've seen through the pandemic is maybe people can work more remotely than we thought. Maybe there's certain jobs that we thought had to be in the office, but with technology and with this experience, maybe it wouldn't be an undue hardship for them to work remotely. So I think what we're gonna see is maybe things changing a little bit in the courts because a lot of people have been working from home who've never done before. And now that they've had that experience and they can show that it actually worked, it's gonna be easier for them to make the argument that they should have telework beyond the time when uh, as, as new uh, businesses start to open up. So the general rule about um, requiring employees to provide medical information before returning to work is typically employers aren't allowed to ask for medical information or perform medical tests unless it's job related and consistent with business necessity. But what we've seen is because of the threat uh, and how contagious COVID-19 is, we're seeing things a little maybe differently than people would have expected under the ADA. And again, the EEOC has some great guidance they developed um, with respect to pandemics before COVID-19 and have added some specific COVID-19 information that I think you'll find helpful. So for instance, during COVID-19, employers can, C-A-N, can ask if employees are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, like fever and chills and coughs and shortness of breath or sore throat. And these are all symptoms that have been identified by the Centers for Disease Control. They can also, this may be a surprise to you, they can, under the ADA, take employees' temperature daily, or they can even administer a COVID-19 test. Uh, even though typically that would be considered a medical examination due to the, the um, direct threat that people might pose if they are positive in the workplace. Uh, I know that the antibody tests, people who've already gotten COVID-19 are not allowed under the ADA. Uh, employers can also require employees to stay home and provide a doctor's note 
confirming they're not contagious before being allowed to return if they have experienced symptoms of COVID-19. As Robin alluded to, this whole issue of people wearing a mask can be very challenging, and it, it also can be difficult in the employment context as well. So what if a person can't wear a mask because of a disability? Well, employers are most likely, and I'm saying most likely because, again, we haven't had the court cases yet, but this is what the EEOC is telling us, that employers are most likely allowed to require employees who interact with customers or other employees, which is typically going to be most folks, to wear a mask to prevent spread of the disease. Um, and the ADA would most, most likely does not require employers to make exceptions to their reasonable mask policy um, for people with disabilities if it's necessary to protect the health and safety of its workplace. However, if the employee cannot wear a mask because of a disability, they still can ask for reasonable accommodation and engage in the interactive process. Remember, that's the brainstorming process to figure out, can we find a solution? Um, and that should still happen, even though there is this general rule of a mask policy for all employees. So here's some examples of accommodations if an employee can't wear a mask. Maybe there's a way to transfer them to a more isolated part of the work site that makes social distancing possible. Um, maybe if they work a different shift that has fewer employees, it can make them possible. Maybe like Robin alluded to, they can wear a mask for just a few minutes and get into an isolated area and then take the mask off and not be a danger. And then of course, as we talked about telework, uh, working from home might be the accommodation if somebody can't wear a mask in the uh, workplace. But then again, we have to show that they can perform the essential functions of the job if they're working remotely. Um, and then employer, employees also need to be creative in thinking that you know, maybe there are certain masks that are problematic for them, but maybe there are others that aren't. And so doing research and trying different options might be uh, required as well. Okay, as I said before, um, the ADA applies to people with disabilities uh, generally, but there is this provision that sometimes can be confusing called association discrimination. Well, what does that mean? Well, the general rule is that people who associate with people with disabilities, like a family member, can't be treated differently simply because of their association. So the classic example is a person is in the workplace, they don't have a disability, and the employer learns that they have a family member with a disability and is concerned that they're going to raise the insurance rates or they're going to have a lot of uh, leave, um, uh, unnecessary leave uh, that will be problematic in the workplace. And if that person is treated differently, the person without the pe person, the person without the disability is treated differently simply because their association with somebody with a disability, that's not allowed under the ADA. However, reasonable accommodation is not required for somebody who associates with somebody with a disability. So reasonable accommodations are only available for somebody who can meet the definition of a disability. So what we often are asked is, can a family member ask for, as a reasonable accommodation, to take leave or to do telework to care for a person with a disability? Or the example we have here is an employee without a disability would they be entitled to um, telework as an accommodation to protect the family member with a disability from potential COVID-19 exposure? No, not under the ADA, they're not because they don't have a disability. Now, again, they are allowed to maybe use their rights under the Family Medical Leave Act to care for a family member, um, but not under the ADA. Of course, employers can always go above and beyond what the ADA requires to provide more flexibility, but we just wanna make sure that it's clear that you're not legally required to provide accommodations to family members, only to people with disabilities. And that would be actual disabilities, reasonable, uh, excuse me, perceived disabilities. The other part that we talked about before, again, is not entitled to an accommodation. You have an actual disability or a history of a disability. All right, now we're to the resources section, and then we'll open up for questions. So this page provides you with three really helpful uh, resources with respect to um, COVID-19 that were put out by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which again, interprets and enforces the employment provisions of the ADA. Um, the first one is, is specifically on COVID-19 and what you should understand. It not only talks about the ADA, but other equal employment opportunity laws. The second one is the document I mentioned before that was prepared prior to the ADA um, for other pandemics like for Ebola and some other things that have happened over the years uh, and has been updated in, in response to COVID-19. And then the third one, which I think is really a great one to check out, 
uh, if you're like me and, and you learn visually and, and audibly as opposed to through reading, um, is to um, check out the Ask the EEOC webinar. Um, they've got on a YouTube channel a really great um, sort of summary. It was done at the beginning of the pandemic, but I think it really can be very helpful as well. As I mentioned before, the Department of Labor enforces the Family Medical Leave Act, and so those new laws that we talked about, extending the Family Medical Leave and the emergency um, sick leave, as well as the Family Medical Leave itself, they have tons of resources that explain all the intricacies and details of these new laws and the existing laws, so check those out uh, if that would be helpful to you. And we at Equip for Quality have been trying to put together a variety of workplace uh, documents. Ours um, are um, really from the perspective of the person with disability, since that's who we represent. So it's more of a self-help kind of information for people with disabilities on a variety of issues. Sorry, the screen's not letting me change to the next slide. Um, let me go up. I don't want to go down. I don't know if, if this was, ends up being the last slide or not. Um, let me just tell you about the other resources because I think you're going to get the uh, PowerPoint. Um, we've got, um, in addition to the Quick for Quality, we also put out some general resources from other organizations like the Job Accommodation Network and the Centers for Disease Control um, and a, um, a group called EARN. And then our last slide. Um, is uh, a slide that has two more general ADA resources, including the Great Lakes ADA Center, the Illinois ADA Project, uh, my organization, Equip for Quality, the Job Accommodation Network, and then the two federal agencies that enforce and interpret the ADA, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for Employment, and the U.S. Department of Justice for the other parts of the ADA. So, um, again, I can't show you those slides based on the kind of grayed out, but um, I assume you'll be getting those and hopefully you can access those as well. So I think at this point, uh, Yasmina will turn over to you for any questions in the remaining amount of time that we have. Thank you, Barry. I just checked there's only 30 slides, so I don't know if something happened and I checked the original PowerPoint, but we can update the resources. This is Robin, I'll send you updates. That's my fault. I was on Oh, okay. I was there have been some funny things happening with um, uh, WebEx today. Some other people with iPads could not join either. So <laughs> I don't know. So maybe I thought something got cut off. Um, all right. So we have a few minutes for questions. I already have a couple. So I, I'm just going to jump in and uh, start asking. The first uh, question was for Robin. What about paratransit services? Will they be required to make exceptions for passengers who can't wear a mask? Um, it's a good question. Department of Transportation has put nothing out specifically on this particular issue as guidance to the Fed, to the transit agencies. I'm saying the Federal Transit Administration. Um, the issue would be um, similar to other um, areas, whether or not legitimate safety requirements would apply given the nature of the ride and such of that nature. We've talked to many different paratransit agencies that are looking at different alternatives that they might be able to provide, which necessarily aren't the best but looking at issues of um, being able to schedule somebody when um, at, at times when there's very low use um, and such where they um, uh, only would, you know, be able to transport somebody solely by themselves um, without other individuals and such, but there's not a real clear guidance on this particular issue. It's again, goes back to that issue of um, uh, legitimate safety requirement and the safety and such of others. So Barry, I don't know if you have anything different you would say on that. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said, Robin. I mean, I think it's it's a time to be creative. So I know some folks are, you know, that normally don't have maybe like that plastic shield between the driver and the rider of putting that up. You see that in taxi cabs and maybe perhaps putting that in the paratransit van would alleviate some of the concerns about um, transmission. So, you know, that's another thing. And, and again, I think, you know, people really have to be creative about face masks and I think a lot of times people try one version, it doesn't work, and then they say they can't wear anything. And I just think there are a lot of options out there that people could explore. You know, some people even, you know, using like turtlenecks and pulling things over their face and things like that, that maybe is easier than some of the other types of things that are out there. So, um, yeah, it, it's a really tricky issue. I hope we get some better guidance or some guidance uh, from the federal government. But until then, I think people just need to be creative and understand okay. that. They can, they can refuse if you don't as a general policy, but they do have to try to accommodate folks if they can. 
And remember that, you know, that they do not have to provide you the one-on-one assistance to get on and off um, and such of that nature, which, you know, is that direct contact issue. So that also can limit people being able to ride, not only being on at their own home, but they might have somebody at home that can help them get on, but what happens at the other end? Right. And, and that's another thing where you have to be creative, like the blind people, you know, typically you might have somebody who goes up and gives an arm and helps them in. Well, just because you can't do that doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. So maybe you do, uh, you know, verbal instructions and work people, you know, help a blind person that way. So modifying what you did before, but still providing assistance is safe. Thank you. Um, many of our attendees work with individuals with developmental disabilities. So some of these questions are really focused on, um, on sort of that population. How do you balance an individual's right to choose to participate in activities against the risks that might carry for the individuals they, li uh, they live with, with in a group uh, setting or a group home setting? Yeah, I mean, I think with that, you have to look at the definition of direct threat. So the direct threat is a substantial limitation of, uh, of, of significant harm. Um, and so you have to look at, is, is there a high risk, um, a significant risk of substantial harm? Sorry, I said that wrong. So is the risk significant? And here with COVID-19, obviously, because of it can be fatal, it is going to be significant. We saw that same sort of analysis with HIV and AIDS when that was first uh, coming out. And then is it going to cause significant risk of substantial harm? So is it likely to be transmitted? And if so, what happens? And as we're seeing, there, there is a substantial harm that happens for a lot of folks. And so um, the thing that people sometimes forget about direct threat, though, is that it's a significant risk of substantial harm with or without a reasonable accommodation. So maybe on the surface of it, it looks like it would be a direct threat, but maybe, again, being creative, there's some accommodations that can be made that the person isn't a direct threat. And remember, again, that the Supreme Court has made clear that direct threat is not only threat um, to others, but threats to themselves. So if it's not only about them being threat, uh, a health risk or safety risk to other people, but if they're, um, the employer or other entity covered by the ADA can show that the person is a threat to themselves, that can't be accommodated through, um, a dis through some sort of reasonable accommodation, they may be excluded from certain activities as well. Thank you. And I think this, some of these questions also um, are pertaining to, to the answer. Can people who live in a group homes be told by the provider that they cannot attend their day program because of the increase of the spread of COVID-19 in the community? The provider has been told that they cannot restrict a person from going to a day program because it violates their rights. How do the rights of one person override the rights of housemates to stay safe? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, it's very similar to the situation. Yeah. It's the same type of analysis. And, you know, every state I know here in Illinois, our, our Division of Developmental Disabilities is working out trans, uh, reopening some of the day programs uh, gradually and are putting restrictions on, on how those will be happening. So some of the social distancing that we've talked about, some of the, um, the masks and requirements there that are happening. What's interesting to me is that some people who haven't been going to their day programs, which are, you know, oftentimes segregated settings with people getting paid subminimum wage, are being creative and doing different things that they're enjoying their day more. And so I think we're going to see some folks who say, you know what, I don't want to go the old way anymore. I want to do something different, like do something in the community or maybe do something within my own home. So I think, you know, you have to look at not only how things were done before uh, and what people wanted before, but now that they've experienced how things could be done differently without going to a day program every day to look at those issues as well. Thank you. Can you provide any tips or advice on advocacy strategies as we move forward with COVID-19 related issues? This is Robin. I think that one of the key things is I think people need to be staying on top of what is going on and raising the questions for themselves, not waiting for agencies and stuff of that nature to come to you. So if you have concerns as it relates to education or you have concerns related to um, service delivery systems and things of that nature, you should be going to them and asking the questions and potentially asking to be part of the discussion for solutions coming up with um, brainstorming and things of that nature, because I think it's really going to be those answers are going to come from us in the community um, and not necessarily the policymakers, but we've got to engage with them and um, uh, make sure that they know and understand that, you know, this shouldn't be an after the fact thought. 
that as they're planning and moving forward with next phase or reopening or whatever, that how are you taking into consideration disability and such a nature, but being proactive, not reactive. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think being proactive and creative together are probably the most important things to do and, and trying to be flexible to achieve what you want. That interactive process we talked about. Thank you. I knew I know we we're to an hour, but we have a couple more questions. So if everyone can stay um, or if, ask your questions now. Um, if there is a stay at home public health order in place, does it trump individual decisions to go out into community? Yeah, I mean, generally, you know, you people are bound by, you know, executive orders by their, their governor or their, their mayor. Um, sometimes there are exceptions within that written in or that you could ask for, you know, for certain issues, like for health related issues. Uh, but generally, people with disabilities are bound by these, these laws. But uh, state and local governments are covered by Title II, and they do have to modify even executive orders uh, to accommodate people with disabilities, as long as you can show it wouldn't be a direct threat, undue hardship, or a fundamental alteration. And, and remember that people with disabilities don't have different rights, you know? So if everybody else is being denied access, you're going to get denied access too, right? So yep. it, the, the issue is, is that I don't get to use my disability to get me better access, it's get me equal access. So that's, that's really where we need to keep that in mind. So, you know, individual choice, you, you can choose to break the law. You can choose to get arrested. <laughs> Um, and such of that nature. Does that, because of the ADA and my disability, I, I'm able to do that, you know, or I should do that? That's the question that has to be raised. Thank you. And um, one last question. What do you see as a major challenge from both of your perspectives moving forward? I mean, for, for me on the employment side of things, I think it, it, there's just a lot of uncertainty about, you know, people returning to work. And I think you have to think about the whole person. So, for instance, a lot of people take public transportation, um, people with disabilities and, and people uh, outside of the disability arena. And that just is raising a lot of concerns for folks at this time. And so I think, you know, employers have to be thoughtful. They have to be flexible. Um, but they also have, you know, the, the ability to make sure that people perform the essential functions of the job. And so um, I think the main thing is, is, again, for that dialogue to be happening, that employers shouldn't impose, you know, very stringent, uh, inflexible policies. They have to modify those when it's reasonable and wouldn't be undue hardship. And to recognize that everybody's situation is different uh, and to not make these uh, hard and fast rules, um, even for certain types of disabilities, because everybody's Disability manifests differently, and COVID-19 seems to manifest differently for different people as well. And I think people need to be planning for the long term and moving forward. I think that we can't, we have to be really careful. I think, you know, initially everybody was like, well, this is only going to be a three or four month thing, you know, and now it's extended out. And I think that, you know, we really need to be thinking about, you know, what is this going to look like in, in January, February, March, and be planning now, because the more that we do that, um, the more prepared we'll be and the more creativity we can impose into it than um, the last minute reaction type of thing. Thank you so much, Robin and Barry. Uh, it, uh, this was a wonderful presentation. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, the presentation has been recorded. We are sharing uh, the PowerPoint slides, all the resources, including the, the ones that cut, got cut off. Um, and I will be posting them on our YouTube channel, and uh, you will be emailed once that is up, usually within a week. Um, just the last thing, if you have any questions, just please, uh, uh, last minute questions, please put them in the chat box. And I just wanted to uh, make you aware of next week's webinar, Hospitalized People with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Need Their Caregivers. They aren't visitors. Um, and the registration link is put in the chat box. Um, again, thank you so much. Feel free to log off. Barry and Robin, if you just wait, let me see if there's any more questions coming through. Just a couple more minutes and then we can um, say goodbye. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. This was a lot of information in 45 minutes. <laughs> so we're just getting lots of thank yous. And yeah. uh, um, 
So feel free to sign off. And thank you again so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.